Uh, it's a great pleasure to have David Edelstein uh, as our first speaker. It's been a long time in the National Security Speaker Series. Uh, I've known David for years, but let me fill you in. He's an associate professor in the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service in the Department of Government at Georgetown University. He's also a member in Georgetown's Security Studies Program and Center for Peace and Security Studies. He received his PhD and MA in Political Science from the University of Chicago. Uh, his first book was uh, Occupational Hazards, Success and Failure in Military Occupation on Cornell University Press. Um, did that win any awards? I'm sure. Honorable mentions. Honorable mentions. Yeah. I've never won an award, so don't feel bad. Uh, okay, it should have won an award. Um, he, I know him best, I've known him for years, but as my associate editor, one of the associate editors at Security Studies, uh, where I can tell you he is one smart dude, and uh, he's now moved on, and he's, uh, you're at international security now. Yeah, he's moved on to the competitor. Yeah, so he's an associate editor at international security now. Um, his paper today, or what he's presenting, is called The Politics of Uncertainty, What Theory and History Teach Us About the Rise of China. And this is part of a book that is being reviewed by Cornell University Press, so I'm sure all will work out fine. So I'm very curious to hear what David has to say, so let's welcome him. Thank you, Randy. Um, it's really, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I say this not to soften you up because I know it won't work, but uh, whenever, I, whenever I have students who come to me sort of undergraduates or master's students and who are uh, asking about PhD programs and where they should go to study international relations, to study international security. Um, Ohio State is always on my list. Um, I really do think this is one of the, the great places in the country studying these issues. So it's, um, it's a pleasure for me to, to be here today. Uh, and as Randy mentioned, um, I want to talk about, and I'll try to do this in 40 minutes or so, I want to talk about uh, the book manuscript that I've been working on. This is a project that is um, sort of long in coming uh, in that I, much of the ideas in this actually have its origins in a dissertation I wrote at Chicago many years ago and then I got, got swept away into working on military occupations for a while and have kind of returned to it but with a, a much different theoretical argument than I was making um, earlier on and also some sort of um, different takes on the, on the evidence. Um, so let me let me start in a way with kind of what what prompted all of this, and then I'll then I'll um, go through the argument and some history and some evidence for you. Um, what prompted this, uh, for better or for worse, as with a lot of people in uh, in this field, is reading something written by John Mearsheimer and getting annoyed by it, um, which was that uh, in this particular case it was. Reading his the 2001 edition, which I say I, I note the 2001 edition because the the second edition, which just came out a year or two ago, the concluding chapter on the rise of China is entirely rewritten um, and rewritten in, in interesting ways. Um, but in 2001, when I read the original edition of it, some of you may be familiar that in the in the concluding chapter in which he talks about the rise of China, he sort of concludes and follows from his argument that the United States and China are on a kind of inevitable collision course, which he hasn't changed that argument um, so much. Uh, he's still arguing they're on a collision course. But that the United States ought to, ought to be acting in ways to undermine the growth of China because of anticipating the possibility that China was going to be a competitor at some point. And not only that, but because he thinks they're, you know, the, the normative things he says, the ought to actually correspond to what states actually do, he says this, he tries to make the case that this is what the United States is, is uh, will eventually do and is doing um, to sort of combat the rise of China. Well, I read that and I sort of thought about at the time and, and continue to think about these enormous trade deficits, for example, that the United States has, has run with China over the last few decades. And it struck me that, that John's argument assumed that the United States was going to be worrying greatly 
about the possibility of a Chinese threat that even John acknowledged was not going to emerge for two or three decades down the road, right? Yet he expected that the United States was going to act now to counteract that possibility of a threat, that still uncertain threat, which was going to emerge 20 or 30 years down the road. And so what I sort of took from that, right, and what sort of prompted some of the thinking that you'll see today is that I think John's understanding of uncertainty, as you see in the title here, and how states respond to uncertainty uh, is problematic. And I also think that missing, not only from John's analysis, but from much of the analysis that we see in international relations, much of the theoretical analysis in international relations, one of the things that's missing is an appreciation of the role of temporal dynamics in international politics, which is to say that sort of the way that states think about things that might materialize 30 years down the road and their willingness to act on it now as opposed to waiting until it actually materializes in, or possibly doesn't materialize. And I think in our study of international relations, with some notable exceptions, say the literature on the shadow of the future and the institutionalist liter literature that, that looks at um, these temporal dynamics in certain ways, I think we haven't paid as much attention to this dimension of international politics as we might. So with that as preface, let me um, just go through a few things. The first of which is to establish something that probably most of you already know, but to give you um, some sort of reminder on it, which um, is the, the rise of China and the, the various ways in which it has, in fact, been happening. Uh, here, the economic rise of China, see GDP in trillions of U.S. dollars, as many of you know, it's Chinese measured this way, uh, the second largest economy in the world. Of course, one takes that um, per capita, and it, China doesn't do as well in per capita terms simply because China has um, so many people. Um, but you can see in terms of its overall GDP, um, it dwarfs those of, of many other states that we consider to be strong economic states. Uh, the military rise of China, and this is meant to capture sort of official budget numbers, adjusted budget numbers. Uh, anybody who's worked in this space knows that uh, gathering accurate information on Chinese defense expenditures is a bit of a, a tricky business. Um, so one needs to take all of these numbers with a grain of salt, but if, if you take that grain of salt and you're still somewhat persuaded by them, the, the line is pretty clear in terms of the, the increase both in sort of raw numbers but also as a percentage of GDP. Worth noting, by the way, on this, and just as a sort of further evidence that, that the Chinese threat, such as it is as a peer competitor to the U.S., is probably still a long ways away, is that if you look at the percentage of GDP, right, the Chinese are spending, in, if, you know, again, according to these numbers, between 1.3 and 1.4 percent of uh, its GDP on defense. That's relative to the United States. That's a very small number, right? That is, that's more like a, and this is, this is not meant to be judgmental in any way, but it's more like a Western European number than it is like um, the United States in terms of, of defense expenditures. Okay. Um, and then this, sorry, this hard for you to see in the back here, but this is just, this, uh, Chinese investments have been getting a lot of attention, right? The idea that China is this sort of insular power, I think, has, has sort of evaporated as the Chinese have become increasingly active around the world. Uh, and you can see it here, those, those sort of pinkish red dots representing the size of Chinese investments around the world. Um, the thing that's gotten a lot of attention, of course, is Chinese uh, investment in Africa, but you can see it's by no one limited there. There's certainly lots in Latin America um, and lots in the, the Middle East. I have a, uh, a occasion every once in a while, Georgetown has a, a campus in Doha in Qatar, which I've been over to a bunch of times. And I will say it's striking when you go to Doha, which is this um, incredibly wealthy state in, in natural gas, um, the, the presence of Chinese businessmen in Doha, right, who are establishing connections there and investing there and, and getting access to um, these natural resource, resources is, um, is striking. Um, another issue that, of course, has gotten a lot of attention and starts to get to the relationship between the United States and China uh, is uh, the holdings of U.S. debt. Um, this sort of gives all of the various uh, holders of U.S. debt, the largest one being here, um, U.S. individuals and institutions. If you go around the wheel here, this 7.9% um, is what the Chinese hold of U.S. debt. And uh, some of you know there's been something of a debate over whether or not this is consequential, 
right, and whether or not the U.S. ought to be worrying about the Chinese holding trillions of dollars in, um, well, literally trillions of dollars uh, in bonds and other, other forms. And, of course, the requisite cartoons, right, with the U.S. and China. This one down here, uh, this is from actually from an Australian source, so you've got the U.S., the Chinese panda, and the Australian kangaroo there, um, and the implied um, tension that's emerging um, there. Okay, so most of this probably familiar to you and just by way of background, but again, for me, the puzzle, right, is that in a variety of ways, I think one can argue that the U.S. has aided in the rise of China, has aided and abetted the rise of China. Yet, history suggests that if you look at relations between rising powers and declining powers, they most often do not end well. Occasionally they do end well, and I'll have a case in here of, of one that did, that did end well. But that in most cases, they don't end well. So the question is, why would the U.S. be doing this, right? Why would the U.S. be aiding and abetting the rise of a future power, a future competitor? Now, what's interesting about this is that it's not just a puzzle with regard to the United States and China. In fact, and I will sort of argue this throughout the, the course of my talk, is that this is actually a general pattern that one can observe in past cases of, of rising great powers. Um, as I write in the, in the introduction to the book, and it, I, as, a, as a father, it always, it always makes me uncomfortable to write this, right? But I, always, I, I write in the introduction to the book that Declining great powers, they do not strangle the baby in the cradle, right? In fact, they help that baby grow up to be big and strong. And moreover, someday they may actually come to regret it, right, in some of the cases that one can identify. So the puzzle is, is why would they do this and what are the incentives that are leading them to do this? Rather than one could imagine a situation in which you acted more proactively to knock out that rising great power. Right, to prevent its rise, presumably at a time when it would be easier to do it before they've become more powerful. Um, as, a, as a good realist, I'll have my requisite Machiavelli quote. I'll have a requisite Thucydides quote later. Um, Machi Machiavelli, though, Machiavelli wrote um, in a way that I, I, I find useful and interesting, quote, the Romans did just what every wise ruler ought to do. You have to keep an eye not only on present troubles but on those of the future and make every effort to avoid them. That is how it goes in affairs of states. When you recognize evils in advance as they take shape, you quickly cure them. But when you have not seen them and so let them grow till anyone can recognize them, there is no longer a remedy. Right? And I think Machiavelli in many ways got at this issue of when do you choose to address a threat and um, what are the factors that might lead you to address it uh, sooner rather than later. All right, so a few, um, a few caveats before I, I jump into this. Um, the first one is to say, and, and I say this all the time out of respect for those who are, um, I'm not a China expert, right? Uh, my expertise is not in the sort of particular study of China, but more the sort of trying to bring theory and history together to think about the rise of China, nor am I a historian, right, and my goal in this book has not been to write sort of new histories of any of the cases of rising great powers that I'm going to talk about. But what I, I hope that this book does, right, is that we have a theoretical literature on power transitions, rising great powers. We have sort of very good kind of one-off histories of particular cases of rising and we have a recent literature of mixed quality on the rise of China itself, right? There are, sh I, have, I have a shelf, an entire shelf full of books on the rise of China, um, some of which are much better than others. Uh, and my goal in this book is in some ways to try and bring those three literatures together, bring the insights from them together, and offer um, a kind of a, an argument about them, okay? All right. So. Just a bit of IR theory for a moment, um, which is to think about what are some of the existing answers that are out there. Um, first, uh, somebody like Mearsheimer, right, would argue that, well, yeah, you see this cooperation, but what is that cooperation? It's a form of buck passing, right, which is to say that 
States try to get others to uh, pay the costs of balancing against an emerging great power. And not only do they try to get others to pay that cost, but while they're trying to get others to pay the cost, they will actually seek to benefit from the cooperation with that rising great power, right? So to the extent there's economic benefits, political benefits, military benefits, this is um, a strategy that would not be completely surprising to see this cooperation. Um, my beef with offensive realism, I, well, I'll have a, a series of them as I, as I go through this talk, but just to start with this, this buck passing argument, one of the major problems, I think, with this buck passing argument is why states ever expect it to work, right? Which is to say that if you're buck passing and everybody else is buck passing, right, nobody's there to kind of pick up the buck, right? And at some point, if, if assuming states are rational, which Mearsheimer assumes they are, they would presumably recognize that nobody else is going to pick up that buck either. So how that is seen as an effective strategy for dealing with a threat, um, I think, becomes problematic. Um, an alternative take on this would be sort of a, a liberal take, and here I'm thinking mostly of somebody like John Eikenberry, um, who uh, would argue that cooperation with a rising great power is a form of order building, right? And Eikenberry famously wrote that sort of the most powerful state in the international system likes to create these orders, lock in these orders while they're the most powerful state in the system, right? Such that when a rising great power gets more powerful than them, they're going to have an interest in that order, and they're not immediately going to seek to overturn that order. So the cooperation, say, the U.S. cooperation with a rising China would be designed precisely to get China to buy into this existing order, right, and then respect that order even when they, at some point, possibly become more powerful than the United States. Um, my issue with this argument largely has to do with why you would expect this type of order building to be kind of sustainable, right? What would, and what would lock in a rising great power once it becomes more powerful, right, from still shifting the order in ways that are to its benefit, right? Um, it's, and, and conversely, why don't we see sort of existing powers acting out of concern for the fact that rising great powers might do this. I'm, I, more generally, I'm unconvinced by the kind of power of this sort of order building mechanism in getting states to, to act this way. Um, I should note, not on here, right, so the, neither of these answers is, is particularly logically or empirically satisfying to me. There's one other argument that is important to note, and especially important to note because he's in the room, right, which is, which is Randy's argument on underbalancing. Right, which um, I'll say Randy's work in general, and again, this is not meant to soften him up, but Randy's work in general has been a great influence on me going back to when I was a, when I was a graduate student. And um, Randy's work on underbalancing right, asks a similar type of question. Right? It's a similar type of question in terms of why we see states not balancing as much as one would expect against potential threats to them. Um, his argument focuses uh, very much on kind of domestic political dynamics, some of which kind of come through in my argument, but I also sort of develop, develop some logics that I think are different than, than Randy's logics. Okay? All right. So, where does my argument go from here? Um, my argument basically focuses on four different sort of dynamics, four different um, elements that I want to um, lay out for you, uh, and what I'm going to try and do uh, over the course of the rest of this talk is I'll, I'll go through um, each of these four dynamics. I'm going to sort of talk a little bit about the kind of theoretical logic underlying each and how they contribute to my overall explanation for why we see this cooperation. I'll back up each of those with some brief, uh, admittedly brief, um, sort of historical evidence drawn from some of the cases that I look at in the book. And then uh, at the end of the talk, I'll return again to uh, the question of China and talk about some of the implications for the rise of China as well as perhaps some more um, theoretical implications uh, in international relations. Okay, so start with um, the, what I call the manipulation of uncertainty. Um, somebody once famously said that anarchy is what states make of it. Um, my argument in some ways uh, is that uncertainty is what states make of it. I think uncertainty in the study of international relations, uh, a certain logic has been attributed to uncertainty that inevitably and invariably 
leads to sort of competitive behavior, right? If you think about the logic of the security dilemma, right? Uncertainty in the security dilemma is, is essentially the root of all evil in the security dilemma, right? The, that, you know, you're uncertain about future intentions, therefore you sort of move in this direction of arming yourself and it leads to this nasty spiral. Mearsheimer, right, he goes even further, right? Uncertainty about future intentions is the root of his argument and it's that uncertainty about intentions that leads states to maximize relative power, right? Because they simply can't be certain about what others um, are going to do. Well, part of my argument here is that uncertainty about future intentions can in fact lead to cooperation, not just competition. I'm not completely sort of saying that uncertainty always leads to cooperation. I am saying that under certain conditions, cooperation rather than competition can be a response to uh, uncertainty. And because of this, right, and because of this, rising powers actually have an incentive to maintain uncertainty about their intentions. The basic logic of this is that it's extraordinarily costly for, let's say, states to assume the worst about another state's intentions under conditions of uncertainty, right? First of all, it's not exactly clear what assume the worst means, right? But even if you figure out what assume the worst means, presumably the response that that would sort of generate from you is an extraordinarily expensive one, right? It would require spending a lot on the military. It would potentially require sort of getting involved in conflicts. It would require sort of undoing economic cooperation. Right? A variety of moves that would be extraordinarily costly. So under those conditions, states would actually, would actually prefer cooperation to this sort of assume the worst outcome. Declining power would prefer that. And a rising power, which also serves to continue to increase its capabilities by having uncertainty about intentions and the cooperation that results, thereby has an incentive to maintain uncertainty about its intentions, right? If it can maintain uncertainty, if it can maintain some doubt that they actually have malign intentions, then there's this equilibrium out there in which both sides would prefer to cooperate rather than to compete. All right. So if that's the case, I would just note it, it raises a puzzle here, and it's a puzzle that I'll come back to in the case of China. Um, which is why do rising powers sometimes turn aggressive, what I would call prematurely, right? And I think it's a question about China at the moment, which is China was doing quite well in the order, in the contemporary order, cooperating with the U.S. and continues to do quite well. Yet in the last few years, it's started to act more aggressively in ways that um, sort of potentially could undermine some of that cooperation. And there's a puzzle there of why you would try to do that when you would start to act more aggressively. Um, I would argue, I do argue, I won't go into this in great detail, that there are sort of domestic political uh, sort of motives that, that play in there. There's also points at which they may get provoked by certain states um, that, that lead rising powers to act in aggressive ways. All right, so let me take that abstraction and put it a little bit more uh, in a sort of concrete um, uh, historical. The Germans like their mustaches. Um, so, not a humored crowd. Um, so, uh, Otto von Bismarck over here, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II over here. Um, Wilhelm II is a little, little fancier. Um, uh, and so, one of the cases I look at in the book is the case of Imperial Germany. And in particular, I focus on the period from 1871 when we get the unification of Germany. Uh, until the formation of the Franco-Russian alliance in 1893, 1894, thereabouts. So what's interesting to this case, about this case, right, and one of the things that I think is striking about this case is that 1871, Germany emerges as a unified state in the center of Europe. Over the course of the previous decade, it has decisively, decisively, won three wars against Denmark, against the Austrians, and finally against the French, right? No doubt in any of those three wars. Yet, <clears throat> from 1871 until the Franco-Russian alliance in 1894, there is not a single concerted balancing effort against Germany, right? There's no doubt about 
the implications of the unification of Germany. There are, uh, I could give you abundant quotes from parliaments across Europe noting the unification of Germany and the transformative effect that was going to have on European politics. Right? Nobody misunderstood the implications of Germany's unification in terms of the capabilities that Germany would have. Yet we don't see any effort to balance against Germany. And the argument that I make uh, to try and explain this right, is that Bismarck was particularly adept at manipulating the beliefs that others had about German intentions. Right? It wasn't just about German capabilities. It was about Bismarck's ability to recognize that what he needed to do, right, what he needed to do was to convince the other states of Europe that Germany was, in fact, a sated power, quote, unquote. Those are his, his words in German, right? That uh, it needed, that Germany was a sated power and it needed to be convinced of that. Whether or not Germany was actually a sated power, something of an open question, but the key was to convince others that they were a sated power. Because what I would argue Bismarck understood was that if he could maintain uncertainty about German intentions, that was enough. That was enough for there to be cooperation throughout this period between Germany and all of the other European great powers, between Germany and Great Britain, between Germany and Russia, and even, in a very interesting period that not a whole lot has been written about, even between Germany and France. 18, late 1870s into kind of the mid-1880s, Germany and France have this detente, right? They sort of start getting along. Economically, they're getting along, right? Everything seems to be going along well, right? So my argument here is not that these countries were sort of overjoyed to see Germany as this sort of great power in the center of Europe. But my argument is that it was not German capabilities alone that was going to drive these powers to start balancing against Germany. And in fact, it's when Bismarck leaves office that sort of coincides with <coughs> Kaiser Wilhelm taking over as the Kaiser and their sort of new German provocative behavior in the early 19, 1890s. There's nothing about German capabilities that changes. Nothing about German capabilities that changes but there are ominous signs of German intentions that change, right? And these states start to become more and more certain about the malign intentions of the new German leadership. Now, in a similar type of way, right, I would just sort of draw a comparison to some of what we've heard from the Chinese in the last few decades. Most famously, um, Deng Xiaoping had his 24-character uh, policy Right, which uh, sort of, he was, as the Cold War was ending, he was giving guidance to his uh, Chinese colleagues on what Chinese foreign policy should be. And he used, uh, again, in Chinese, but translated, used words like, we should hold our ground, be cool-headed, but that China must not be, quote, unquote, impatient. Hide our capacities and bide our time. Hide our capacities and bide our time, right? There was no incentive for China, as Deng understood it, right, to act provocatively in ways that were going to provoke a balancing reaction that might otherwise not happen. Okay. So, first element of the argument is this uh, aspect of uh, manipulating uncertainty. Second element of the argument are what I call now or later dilemmas. This gets to the temporal dynamics that I was talking about. It's very easy to understand why a rising power would proclaim its benign intentions, right? Well, very easy to understand why they would do that. It's perhaps more difficult to understand why existing powers, declining powers, would ever accept those benign proclamations, right? Again, they know from other cases that these rising powers may be up to no good once they get more powerful. So why would you ever believe when Bismarck says we're sated? Right? or any other particular leader says we have no malign intentions when the Chinese say it's our peaceful rise. Well, I attribute sort of this, this acceptance or what is an implicit acceptance of these proclamations to what I call now or later dilemmas. This gets at the temporal dimensions that I was talking about. And what I argue is that existing powers face this dilemma. And essentially the dilemma is they can act now against an uncertain threat, 
right, an uncertain potentially emerging threat, act now when that threat is weaker and it would be less expensive to do so, but when there is still uncertainty about that threat, right, and it would not be costless. Or they can essentially kick the can down the road. They can act later when the potential threat may be stronger but more certain. So it's going to be more costly in the future, but there's a possibility that by waiting, this threat won't materialize and they won't have to do anything about it. And the argument I make here is that with regard to these rising powers, leaders generally prefer to act later. They prefer to kick this can down the road for reasons that I'll elaborate on. But just to sort of, um, I don't know, try to give myself some legitimacy, uh, Robert Jervis, none other than Bob Jervis, has argued, quote, national leaders generally hesitate to take strong actions in the face of such uncertainty. While one common motive for war has been the belief that the situation will deteriorate unless the state acts strongly, and then indeed this kind of fear drives the security dilemma, leaders usually put off decisions if they can. Leaders are, quote, predisposed to postpone, to await further developments in information, to kick the can down the road. Right. And so why do they believe these proclamations of benign intentions? Because it's convenient for them to do so, because it allows them to kick the can down the road. All right. So. Another case I look at here, uh, the case of interwar Germany or the resurgence of Germany. I focus in particular, I focus more, I think, on a period that's received, obviously there's lots of study in the 1930s. I spend a little bit more time looking at the 1920s, in particular the mid to late 1920s. Uh, the gentleman on uh, your left there is Gustav Stresemann, uh, who was a German leader uh, during the Weimar period, and then this photo is from um, Stresemann, Austin Chamberlain, and um, Aristide, Bri Aristide Briand uh, at the Locarno Conference. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Treaty of Locarno, the Treaty of Locar Treaties of Locarno in, in 1925, which were essentially a series of agreements among the European great powers that were the beginnings of offering relief to the Germans from uh, the the obligations that had, that had been imposed on them in the Treaty of Versailles. Now, what's interesting to me about this case is that Stresemann very well understood some of the dynamics I'm talking about. Stresemann acted like Bismarck did, right? He tried to manipulate others' beliefs about German intentions. He did his best to convince them that Germany had no interests in acting aggressively again. And so then the question becomes, why did these European leaders believe those proclamations, right? Why do the French, of all people, possibly believe these proclamations, right? And my argument is that a combination of two things, right? First, there were domestic political incentives for them to kick this can down the road. Economically, it was quite painful, right, already what was going on in Europe, and it was going to be even more painful if they tried to punish Germany even more. But also, they all had a hope, these leaders, to varying degrees, had a hope that between now and later, they could actually shape German intentions in a more benign direction. They didn't think that Germany was necessarily going to be their best friend, right? But they thought they could at least encourage Germany to not pursue war again and pursue a more cooperative approach to European politics, okay? Um, just to note, I'm not the only one to sort of have fixed on the Locarno treaties is particularly important. Um, <clears throat> A.J.P. Taylor writes that Locarno was the turning point of the years between the wars. Its signatures ended the, ended the First World War. Its signature ended the First World War. So Taylor put in the end of the First World War with the Locarno treaties. Its repudiation, 11 years later, marked the prelude to the second. So this cooperation signaled at Locarno becomes important to defining the contours of the interwar period. All right. Next sort of theoretical component here. All threats are relative. And not just in terms of capabilities, but here, again, I focus on the sort of temporal dynamic. Threats are relative in terms of time, which is to say that addressing threats is expensive. Great powers are often going to 
face more than one threat at a time, and one of the ways in which they decide which of those threats they're going to address is which ones are certain and immediate as opposed to which are uncertain and distant. Addressing long-term potential threats is, as I say here, a luxury of the secure and wealthy. And so, you know, one sort of contemporary example, and then I'll give a historical example. The contemporary example is, I think if you look since the end of the Cold War at U.S., the kind of U.S. discussion over the nature of China and the threat posed by China, it has ebbed and flowed with the presence of other threats, right? So if you go back to the 1990s, right, those halcyon days of the 1990s, right, there was lots of literature on the rise of China. Right? and the potential threat that was going to be posed by China. And that's because there was nothing else out there. Right? I like to, I, I go back, I don't say I like to, that sounds a little weird, but I, I go back, if you, look at the, if you look at the Republican presidential primary in 2000, George W. Bush and John McCain, what was the major foreign policy issue then? The major foreign policy issue in that Republican primary was what to do about China, right? and whether to take a harder line on China. Some of you will remember this, the summer before 9-11, the EP3 incident, right? If only we were living in a world where things like the EP3 incident were the, the most sort of dramatic news that we were dealing with, right? But the U.S.-China relationship was getting a lot of attention. 9-11 happens, a more immediate, a more certain threat is identified, and suddenly China becomes in some cases a partner or a potential partner in that quote-unquote global war on terror, right? Uh, and in general, there's less attention to the danger posed by the rise of China. When Iraq and Afghanistan in the last, last few years, when they start to recede in terms of importance, when Al-Qaeda is seen by some as less of a pressing threat to the United States, I'd argue the attention, po that, the attention that was being paid to the rise of China picked up again. So again, addressing long-term potential threats is a luxury of the secure and wealthy. In the 1990s, the United States was secure and it was wealthy. And so it could do this. Okay. But to give another sort of historical example, case that ends well, the case of the United States, and in particular Anglo-American relations. And again, I apologize that some of you won't be able to see these, these maps very well. These maps call, uh, capture three particular crises that defined Anglo-American relations at the end of the 19th century the beginning of the 20th century, the Venezuela crisis, a uh, crisis over the building of the Panama Canal, and a crisis over the border between Alaska and Canada. Uh, just to kind of give you a sense of what was it, a quick sense of what was at stake in each. Uh, in the case of Venezuela, it was really a question over sort of Venezuelan sovereignty and Venezuelan t territorial control and whether or not the British were going to sort of abide by Venezuelans' wish within their, within their territory, and the United States winds up siding with the Venezuelans um, as opposed to the British. In the case of the Panama Canal, there was recognition that a canal was going to be built through the Isthmus of Panama. The question was who was going to control it, who was going to build it, and who was going to control access to it. And then finally, uh, the Alaska-Canada boundary. This was one of a few border issue, issues. This one became particularly important uh, once gold was discovered in the area and it was thought to be potentially uh, economically lucrative. Um, just before I explain why these cases are important, just to make the, the point that these were not unimportant cases to either the British or the United States, the British right of the Canada dispute, the abandonment of Canada to the land forces of the United States would apparently leave our grain trade with the Dominion and South America at the mercy of American cruisers. Such a condition of affairs might result in our being compelled to sue for peace on humiliating terms. In terms of the canal, again, British documents on this. To sum up the situation from a purely naval and strategical point of view, it appears to my lords that the preponderance of advantage from the canal would be greatly on the side of the United States, and that it is not really in the interests of Great Britain that it should be constructed. Right? They were willing to give up the canal entirely if it was going to be under sort of U.S. control. Well, that doesn't last very long, right? Uh, and in fact, uh, in each of these cases, 
in sequence. In each of these cases, the British concede entirely to the United States. One by one, they concede entirely to the United States. Right? And the argument I would make here is part of it was a certain affinity they had for the United States, kind of an identity-based affinity they had for the United States, that they felt like they could entrust their interests to the United States. But in some ways, an even greater concern was that the British also had their eye on the Germans, right? And the British could only sort of deal with one of those threats at a time. And for them, the Germans were a much more immediate and a much more certain threat than the United States were to these particular interests. All right. Then finally, the salience of intentions. For long-term threats, potential long-term threats, beliefs about intentions, I'd argue matter as much, if not more, than assessments of capabilities. For offensive realists, it's uncertainty about future intentions that inevitably leads to competition. But in the logic of my argument, it's precisely because intentions can change that may, in some cases, lead to cooperation. States pay a lot of attention to intentions. Behavioral signals as well as political and social characteristics can inform those assessments of intentions. And again, contrary, I think in some ways this is the most problematic element of the offensive realist argument. The offensive realist arguments, and here Mearsheimer, Sebastian Rosado writing recently, right, seem to assume that if you are not 100% certain about another state's intentions, you must assume the worst about them. Um, I think all of us in our daily lives, uh, and also states, um, act in probabilistic ways, right? And that one, it's sort of, I think, silly to assume that if they are not 100% certain, they are not certain at all. Um, so the ways in which these probabilities affect their behavior, I think, is important. All right, so the last case I look at here, the case of the Soviet Union. And here I would argue that what was ultimately most important in, in sort of launching the Soviet Union, or launching the Soviet, launching the Cold War, right, with the Soviet Union, was not Soviet capabilities, although they were certainly concerning, but Soviet behavior in 1945, 1946, that raised grave concern about Soviet intentions. Um, this photo is of uh, a Soviet tank in northern Iran in 1946, and then a newspaper article about a Soviet claim on the Dardanelles uh, in Turkey. Both of these crises, and I can go into more detail, but I'm running short on time, um, both of these crises uh, turned out to be sort of litmus tests of Soviet intentions, and when the Soviets didn't answer them, like the U.S. wanted, um, the concerns about uh, the Soviet behavior and where it might go were only heightened. Um, just to, again, a few quotes from Mark Trachtenberg, the preeminent Cold War historian, writes, quote, the Cold War did not develop out of the quarrel over Eastern Europe. It was the dispute over Iran and Turkey that instead played the key role in triggering that conflict. A U.S. briefing book prepared for the Yalta Conference surmised, quote, Iran is considered a testing ground for the United States, United Kingdom, and USSR cooperation, and for the principles of Dumbarton and Oaks. That was for the Yalta Conference, so it was well before the end of the war and the real crisis in Iran. It was going to be a testing moment, though, and the Soviets did not answer that test in the way that the U.S. wanted it to. Finally, and in general, a U.S. Army report wrote that neither the United States nor the British Army can by the greatest stretch of the imagination be accused of expansionist or aggressive ambitions. A somewhat self-serving interpretation, perhaps. But Russia, however, has not as yet proven that she is entirely without expansionistic aims. Right? And again, Iran and Turkey raised grave concerns about that. Okay. So, to summarize, the politics of uncertainty. Uncertainty about the future can encourage cooperation as much as competition. Rising powers have incentives to manipulate beliefs about their intentions. Declining powers have incentives to put off the expense of balancing against that emerging threat. And most generally, temporal dynamics, I would argue, have generally been underappreciated. Um, this is where I was going to give you that Thucydides quote, but I'll put it off just in the, the interest of time. I can give it to you later if you want it. Because um, Thucydides actually sort of appreciated as well these kind of temporal, temporal dynamics um, and uh, dealing with threats now or later. All right. So the question about China, China's peaceful rise is a cartoon from, a, from China Daily um, of China and sort of, you get the sort of image there. Um, 
We know, of course, of sort of recent events, uh, the Spratly Islands, disputes over the Spratlys, uh, more sort of focused map on the various uh, island issues there. Fiery Cross Reef, one of these, I find this whole thing fascinating, right? One of these uh, reefs that the Chinese have been building up into a kind of a, a, an airstrip and who knows what else, uh, one among many that they've been doing this. And then a few weeks ago, this is actually the, the Lassen. A few weeks ago, the USS Lassen, which of course uh, was uh, sailing through the South China Sea and, and tried to send a bit of a message to the Chinese by, by sailing close to one of these Chinese quasi islands, whatever, whatever one wants to, to call them. So what do, we, what do we take from all this? How ought we understand um, all this? So, uh, first, the track record of the U of U.S. aiding the rise of China is not surprising. It's not surprising historically what's happened in previous cases. It's not surprising, I think, theoretically for the reasons I've tried to suggest. Um, Washington has generally preferred later to now for addressing the potential Chinese threat, except, again, those moments where the, Chinese have, where the U.S. has felt wealthy and secure and might pay more attention to that long-term threat. U.S. attention to the threat from China depends on other threats and their sort of not only the, the size of those threats, but the sort of temporal proximity of those threats. Um, and that provocative Chinese behavior in the last few years is, I'd argue, sort of premature, but responsive to both domestic and international pressures. Domestically, there have been plenty of accounts of sort of nationalist pressures within China for a more assertive foreign policy. Internationally, I think one of the interesting aspects of these disputes over the last few years is that the Chinese are, in much many media accounts of this, the Chinese are, are always posed as the ones acting aggressively. And I would not dispute the fact that in some cases the Chinese have aggress acted aggressively. But there's been no shortage of, of aggressive, provocative behavior by, say, the Philippines or by Japan, right? And what I would argue happening in those cases is that that provocation, it's difficult for the Chinese just to say we're not going to respond. Right? And what winds up happening is Chinese aggression sort of rises as a consequence and um, uh, concerns about its intentions rise as a consequence. Long-term prognosis, um, Sino-American tension, I would argue, and this is no great insight, is likely even if war, I would argue, is far from certain, um, far less certain than others um, might claim. Um, the U.S. ought to be wary of being drawn into conflict on behalf of allies or partners. And again, this is a reference to what I just mentioned in terms of Japan and the Philippines and, and their own role in keeping these crises going in the South China Sea. Um, and as much attention is paid to the gross growth of Chinese, the Chinese military or the Chinese economy, what I would argue is really going to be decisive in determining the, the shape of Sino-American relations going forward is not only what Chinese intentions actually are, but how the United States perceives those intentions and the beliefs it forms about them. Um, theoretical implications, um, just sort of take a step back from this. Um, I would emphasize the importance again of temporal dynamics. I think this is something that goes well beyond uh, sort of the study of rising great powers. Uh, so, for example, I would draw attention to everything from climate change policy. I found myself reading various things on climate change policy, which is a clear case in which there are long-term concerns in which states are more or less willing to make short-term, pay short-term costs in order to address those long-term concerns. Um, and of course, when I started working on this project, all my friends in IPE uh, told me that I needed to go look at the, the literature on central bank independence, right, which is, a, tries to address this problem of political leaders have incentives to act certain ways uh, in the short term for their political sort of well-being that may not be in the long-term interest of a country's economy. Thus, you create these independent central banks. Um, I do not recommend the central bank independence literature to anybody. Um, just my own opinion. I'm sorry if I offended anybody. Um, and so in general, I think we need more of that. The uncertain role of uncertainty, I think we need more sort of thinking about what role uncertainty actually plays. Uh, and again, beliefs about intention matter as much as assessments of capabilities. So um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. And thank you for uh, listening. <laughs>
Yeah. Well, I think this is this is one of the other reasons, right, why s states have typically been reluctant to, uh, pers to to take actions that are directed against a longer-term threat, right? Um, because you do have to mobilize that domestic support, right? And I think making the case that you should pay a heavy cost now, right, because some threat is going to materialize in 30 years, right, I think is a, is a difficult case to make, right? It's a difficult case to make, by the way, just to return it. It's a difficult case to make with the rise of China. It's a difficult case to make with climate change, right? It's in, in these kind of, I think these dynamics are, are similar, right, that um, domestically uh, sort of mobilizing support for, for long-term behavior is, is hard. Now, the one interesting thing I would say about this is I've gone back and forth, and I continue to go back and forth on the, um, the regime type element of this. Right? So on the one hand, there'd be an argument out there that would say, this is a particularly problematic issue for democracies, right? Because leaders have to worry about the next election, so they, you know, they have to worry about short-term costs and they can't worry about the long-term. I think there's some reason to kind of question the validity of that argument as pertaining just to democracies, right? Um, you know, certainly leaders, even if they, they um, you know, face the next election, they may be able to sort of couch things in some cases for the more long term. And, you know, the, the sort of the, the converse of the facing the next election argument has often been that, you know, it will be lame ducks that will take that long term sort of because they don't have to worry about the next election, but even they worry about how their party is going to do. And I would just say on the kind of the autocracy side, right, um, some would say, well, they have autocracies are, or authoritarian leaders are sort of secure and therefore can sort of take more long-term um, sort of oriented policies. I think most of the, the excellent um, recent literature on authoritarian regimes has pointed out that they have as many sort of domestic audiences to answer to in many cases as, as democratic leaders do. So I'm not convinced that there's a kind of regime type slant to this, but some people would argue that there is. Alex. Thank you. You're not going to give me the good, the bad, and the ugly? This is it. I got it. So when Alex and I were graduate students at Chicago at one point, and Alex gave a talk, and um, Chicago has this reputation of being a particularly nasty, brutish world when it comes to sort of everything. Um, and Alex had given this talk, and I was sitting there preparing to give him comments, and I opened my comments by saying, I have X number of comments that can be divided into three categories, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and Alex wouldn't talk to me for about six months after that, I think. Yeah, so, really yeah. the good part. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, okay, well, then I will ask the first <laughs> Yeah. So is it possible that Mearsheimer is actually right, that for every case of the power that did rise, there are nine or ten cases yeah. where there was some candidate great power that was undermined, and so it just never broke? Right. Um, let me take the last one first. But it's, it's a great question. It's actually it's on my, it's on my whiteboard in my office of projects to think about at some point, is the, the kind of the, the potential great powers who never became great powers, right? Um, it's for, I think, reasons that are pretty – Pretty easy to figure out. It, that's, that's a hard project to kind of figure out uh, who to figure out what those states are, right? But it, I, it's a great question, an interesting question. I, I, I can't think of a lot of them, which 
part of the reason why I haven't done that project yet, right? Um, but I, it's a it's a good question. So on the, the first two points about so first, who am I arguing against, right? Am I just arguing against Mearsheimer? No, I mean I think Mearsheimer is a particular target of mine, but I I think this is an argument against a sort of uh, in some ways a kind of a wider realist literature, right? That has sort of I think assumed a certain dynamic to um, kind of power transitions. It's also I think arguing uh, I would. I would sort of frame my book as being more attentive to a different part of power transitions that have typically achieved the most, or gotten the most attention, right? Which is that um, I think there's a lot of, there's, you know, if you think about somebody like Dale Copeland, right? I mean, his book focuses very much on this kind of period, you know, just before the war, right? And trying to explain the war and, uh, you know, sort of chooses on the dependent variable to look at the wars, right? Um, I try in each of these cases to look somewhat earlier in a great power's rise, which I think are sort of periods that have not kind of gotten as much attention or in some cases a resurgence of that rise. It's not in all the cases, but in, in sort of some of the cases um, looking at that. Um, and then the liberal argument, yes and no, right? I mean, I would, uh, I, I buy the, to some extent, I buy the kind of absolute gains argument, right? I think that's part of what motivates this kind of short-term incentive for cooperation is just we want to get richer and doing business with them gets us richer. Um, I just, I'm hard pressed to find much evidence of um, these existing powers thinking about this cooperation with the rising power in a way that they actually, that, that they're actually doing the kind of order building thing. Right? It's just not how they're thinking about what they're, what they're doing, right? Um, and even in the case of the U.S. and China, right, there are some people who would say that is what the U.S. is doing, right, trying to, the whole, you know, responsible stakeholder narrative, right? But talk to lots of other people, and I think we'll get lots of other behavior by the U.S., and it's not abundantly clear that that's what the U.S. is actually doing. Um, so, you know, I think, I think in some ways the logic might work for that liberal argument, but the evidence isn't there for it. The other out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I agree with Alex P. that it's a very good talk. Definitely plausible arguments. Um, uh oh. I mean, I'm trying to resist asking the constructive question. Yeah. I'm not in that business anymore. I just will make an observation. Yeah. And I'll my question. The observation is that my own sense is that intentions are heavily contextual. Mm -hmm. and Yeah. Yep. 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 Okay. But the question I wanted to pose, um, not a constructive question, is just um, so the puzzle of, of this talk is, you know, the U.S. has aided the rise of China. Um, and why have they done this? And the assumption there, and also the assumption I think in both authors' realism and the liberal version that we talk about, is that that aiding China's rise is intentional. Mm. Um, great, thank you. Both, both great questions. First, first um, I have a whole series of friends who tell me regularly that I'm a constructivist, and uh, you know, uh, I'm okay with that at this point in life, right? Um, even Steve Walt will admit he's a constructivist, right? Um, no, I, you know, I take, I take the point. I, in seriousness, I take the point, and and malleability. Yeah, it, it's not something I talked about a lot today, but it's in the book, and it's kind of part of the part of the discussion, um, and. Uh, yeah, so no, no disputing that and, and would endorse it. Um, 
On the, the Marxist point, right? I mean, that's, yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, I've heard, this, I've heard this argument sort of framed slightly differently, right, as kind of a liberal economic interdependence argument, right, which is that, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily the kind of Marxist capitalism thing as much as, you know, you have two states that are deeply intertwined, deeply interdependent at this point, and they simply, you know, they, they won't fight a war against one another um, for that reason, right? So I find that, um, so it's interesting, right, because I haven't heard the Marxist argument before, and that might actually be more convincing, right? Because my, my problem with the economic interdependence argument is explaining the origins of it in some ways, right? And it's, it's, it's easy to explain where we are now, but not necessarily the kind of origins of that relationship. I think the Marxist argument maybe sort of gets around that, right, in the sense that kind of capitalism has been here long before the kind of Sino-American relationship over the last 30 years, and there was a certain kind of inevitability to the, the march of, of capitalism. Um, uh, it's an interesting argument. I, I'll have to think more about that kind of Marxist sort of take on it, right? I'm, a, I'm much more comfortable rejecting the kind of liberal economic interdependence argument, at least at least for explaining the kind of earlier period of relations. Um, the Marxist one, I just I need to think more about the logic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Correct. The Marxists are kind of a wild card. Yeah. American Yeah. Britain. Right. They're still. Yeah. 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 No, that's really useful. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes. In the back. Well, I think this is I think this is part of the the element of uncertainty, right? Which is that I think anybody who's assuming that China is going to look a certain way in 30 years, right? Whether that way is this kind of regional and potentially global behemoth, or whether it's the state has that has collapsed in on itself, right? I'm not comfortable predicting what that's going to be 30 years, and I certainly wouldn't be comfortable sort of saying, and I don't think kind of governments are generally comfortable sort of adopting policies that are predicated on some, some prediction for what things are going to look like 30 years from now, right? So I think, I think you're absolutely right that this, but this, to me, this is part of the contributing factor to this uncertainty, which, again, the kind of standard narrative in IR is that uncertainty leads to bad things. In this case, I think uncertainty um, kind of is more open-ended and, and, you know, leads some to think, well, maybe we need to wait a little bit on acting on this Chinese threat. Thank you. Randy. I'm not sure he would agree with the first one. He would. He'd say attention is likely to be like a U.S. ought to be wary of being thrown into conflict on behalf of allies. Well, I think he's somewhat of a question, like you said, he's brought up the buck passing. And I think, anyway, I, I think the point is that John I mean, he's, he, John, John has argued that war between the U.S. and China is, is just short of an inevitability, right? right? So, so that's 
Yeah. Because, look, I think what you say yourself, China right. isn't spending that much on its military. Yeah. China's right a long way off. And, and this, this discussion I'm having is that you can get, you can get um, anything can happen with China from now yeah. in the next 20 years. You know, yeah. Minshaw paid this, you know, there, there's a growth trap. There's all kinds of things. The government can fall apart. We have no way of knowing that China is going to overtake us. I mean, there's so much. So um, uh, I'm, I'm chuckling a little bit, uh, if only because precisely what you just described was actually what an earlier version of the argument looked like. Um, an earlier version of the argument looked precisely was, was precisely this. It was precisely making the argument that um, declining powers tend to have shorter time horizons because they're worried that they're declining, right? Um, and they need to focus on sort of mitigating their decline or whatever they're going to do about it, right? Whereas a rising power kind of can sit back and sort of think about that kind of long term. And then the argument was really about kind of the interaction of those different time horizons and, and what, what results, right? And sort of why you see cooperation under some circumstances under others. Maybe I should go back to that. Um, yeah, uh, or spin it out in some other form, right? I, I mean, I would just say that I think part of um, – Part of the problem with that argument, right, as it was framed then and what I've sort of tried to move away from in the sort of current framing of it was um, it turns out to be exceedingly difficult to um, measure a government or a leader's time horizons, right? Exceedingly difficult to do it, right? Um, there are people, you know, there's fascinating um, kind of um, psychological and behavioral economics work that has kind of experimentally kind of gotten at the time horizons of individuals in really interesting ways. And I read literature on everything from heroin addicts and their time horizons to, um, to, to no joke, uh, an article about carrier pigeons and their, their time horizons. Right? I mean, it's really, really, truly interesting stuff. But kind of mapping that on to international relations and kind of how leaders and governments think about it is tough. So it, part of the reason I moved away from that was anything that required me to make judgments about long time horizons versus short time horizons was proving to be um, exceedingly difficult to do in a, in a way that was convincing people. Well, and I, in fact, I, you know, I think that's largely what states do, right? I mean, I, sort of discerning intentions is difficult, right? Um, and it's notoriously difficult. All the things you said, I also think that we're, we're kind of, if we set it up as we need to have 100% certainty about it, then we're, we're never going to achieve that, right? Um, uh, and I would, my own take on how states discern intentions is, is I think, consistent with what you said, which is I, I see it very much as kind of a, a sort of Bayesian process, right? You know, there's sort of always information coming in. The states kind of assess the credibility of that information, and they update their priors based on that new information they've got, right? And it's sort of this constantly evolving sort of type of thing, right? Um, I don't think states wake up one day and say, here's what the state's intentions are, right? Um, I also think that state intentions don't actually change all that often, but that's a different that's a different issue, right? That 
article that I'm working on with, with regard to that. Um, on the Glazer um, proposal, right, which, um, yeah, for those of you who don't know, Charlie Glazer has made this argument that, that basically the U.S. and China should kind of come to a, a grand bargain, right, to kind of resolve their issues, and that grand bargain would involve the U.S. basically ceding Taiwan and, and saying you can have Taiwan and kind of, you know, based on the idea that Taiwan is really kind of the, the epicenter of potential sort of trouble between the U.S. and China. It's not that important to the U.S. measured in any number of ways, so, you know, let's strike that grand bargain. Um, one of the things I love about Charlie is that he is so rational to his core, right? Um, uh, it in some ways makes eminent sense, right, what he's, what he's suggesting. Um, my own sense on it is that it, while it makes some sense from a kind of that rationalist perspective that there are all sorts of political impediments to it that, that make it, you know, that, that just, it, it, it's not going to be feasible for those kind of political reasons, right, even if from some rationalist perspective, right, you know, I would, I would be in favor of any, uh, well, not any, but I'd be in favor of lots of bargains that might prevent conflict, right? And, you know, this is, you know, I mean, this goes back to kind of, oops, to kind of Fearon's, you know, fundamental insight, right? That, you know, there are all these, there should be bargains available that, that help you kind of resolve things um, uh, without having to pay the cost of war. So, you know, in that sense, I think Charlie's idea is creative and interesting and makes an awful lot of sense, and I also think it'll never happen. Uh-oh. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh-huh. No, I, 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 I actually take this point, and um, it's something that you know we're all we're all our own toughest critic, right? And I have I have great respect for historians, right? Um, and and the work, and I couldn't do my work without the work that historians do. In the in some of these cases, right? Um, and I think the the U.S. China my analysis of the U.S. China case in particular, right? Um, I would I would plead guilty to them being. Um, I don't want to quite go as far as saying ahistorical, right, but sort of, but kind of taken out of a historical context, right, in a way that is, can be problematic, right? And so, you know, I, the book manuscript, I, I presented a version of it, you know, one of these book manuscript workshops that people do these days, and I, I presented a version of it, and I had, I had people saying, well, you should go back, you should go back to um, uh, kind of the, the sort of U.S.-Chinese sort of detente, you know, sort of period, and and kind of trace the U.S.-Chinese relationship up through the 1970s to, and you get a kind of a, a different picture if you take that slice of history, right? Um, I, for a variety of reasons, I wasn't going to do it at that moment, um, namely the amount of time it was going to take me to do that well, right? But, you know, the other problem is, well, why, why draw the line there, right? Well, you know, don't you even need to go back sort of further than that, right? And, and next thing you know, like you say, you're writing a sort of a history of, of Sino-American relations. So, I take the point very much. I think in the book I try to kind of give some historical context for it, but um, yeah, it's a challenge of sort of taking this period out. 
Hmm. Yeah. So on the first point, you know, I think it, it would be a it would be a considerable challenge for the Chinese to um, invade Taiwan. Um, it would it would not it would not go well for for them, right? Uh, you know, um, and so. Well, I don't know where one goes with that, but I, I'm not I'm not particularly concerned about the the Chinese acting aggressively in, against Taiwan in the in the near the the very near future. Um, I think the and then on your second point on Brazil, yeah, I mean there are there are cases. Brazil is one of the when I when this question is asked, right? What are the what are the would be great powers, right? Uh, Brazil is one that always comes up. Um, uh, you know, beyond Brazil, there there aren't as many that come up, right? Yeah. Japan, right. Well. Yes, Japan is the other. Yes, right. Right. I'm I'm evidence number one. I I, I studied Japanese in college. Because, because I was an IR scholar, and I had been convinced that Japan was going to be the next, was going to be the next great power. I don't remember any of my Japanese now. Right? Um, so no offense. To any, but, you know, yeah, Japan is one that clearly didn't, didn't materialize. Yeah. Right, so um, I think it's a combination of things, right? And I, I don't, um, I don't think one, I, I don't, I don't quite get the the drive that some people feel to sort of you have to figure out the kind of one thing that that states look to to discern intention. It has to be this or it has to be that. I, maybe it's that I'm not as convinced that we need to have these ultra parsimonious theories of things, but. Um, I think, it's a, I think it's a combination of things, and I, and I would, would put them in sort of two kind of broad categories, right? The, the first are sort of behavioral signals, right? Um, sort of behavior and, and you know, here uh, sort of, you know, there's the whole costly signaling literature in political science that has sort of said you can only pay attention to these costly signals. I'm not actually sure that's true, right? I think even kind of non-costly signals can have sort of important sort of shaping effects in how countries think about uh, intentions. Um, so I think there are sort of behavioral signals. And then I also think there are a variety of sort of what I would call kind of domestic characteristics that are, that are important here. And, and um, so that would include uh, regime type, right? So I do think that states pay attention to whether or not their state's a democracy or not, and that matters to some extent. I also think, and, and here to go back to Alex's point, this is when I, I start to sound a bit constructivist-y, right? I, you know, if, if you look at the, the nature of Anglo-American relations in the early 20th century, it is hard to ignore the role that identity and race played in the sort of the reconciliation of the U.S. and Britain, right? I mean, the, the, the documents, everything are just, they're just replete with um, kind of references to this, this kind of, you know, ethnic relationship between, between the two countries. Um, so. Uh, you know, I think I would include that, and I think, you know, how do states discern intentions? I think they're capable of looking at all these things, right? And they try to come to an overall picture that gives them some assessment of what they think another state is, is likely to do in, in some area. Well, with that, I want everyone to thank David for an absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Thanks.